Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of the Whatever History Podcast. Interesting title, right? Today I'm going to talk about the Communist Revolution in China and whether or not it brought progress to the People's Republic of China. For this episode, I'm mostly going to focus on the economic and civic results of the revolution. But before I go into the ramifications of the revolution, I first gotta give you some background info on it. The Chinese Civil War began in 1945 after the country was divided into three regions by the Sino-Japanese War. The three areas were Nationalist China, Communist China, and Japanese-occupied China. At first, Nationalist China and Communist China fought against Japan together, but when the common enemy was defeated, both parties tried to unite China under their rule. A civil war broke out. After a fierce standoff, in 1949, the Nationalists retreated to Taiwan, and Mao Zedong proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China on October 1st. I gave you a very condensed version and I really recommend you check out other sources to get a better understanding of what happened. I used Britannica for this background info by the way. So that is a quick rundown of the revolution, but how did it affect China? Was it good? Was it bad? Let's find out. I used four main sources to make this podcast. The first one is a New York Times article, the second is a research paper, the third is a propaganda poster, and the last one is an interview I did myself. All of these sources have different views and perspective on the topic, and I believe all of them are valuable. The New York Times article was written in 1983 by Richard Bernstein. He is still writing for New York Times, but now he mostly works on the Letter from America column. He still writes some articles about China, and he has been a foreign correspondent for both Time Magazine and the New York Times in Europe and Asia. He also wrote multiple books about China and the Communist Revolution. In his article, he argues that the revolution did not bring progress to rural areas of China, and instead harmed the people there. According to him, the Chinese countryside is dominated by surviving traditions, pride prices, rural superstitions, and ancestor worship, along with the plain hardships of rural life. However, his point is mostly supported just by Stephen W. Mosher's book Broken Earth, where Mr. Mosher describes his experience visiting China. The problem with this is that a single account of an individual's experience and some interviews alone could not provide a fair and accurate picture. Bernstein himself notes that Mr. Mosher's challenge to the conventional assumption that rural life in China has greatly improved since 1949 is not definitive, and that there is no systematic weighing of the factors that make up the quality of life. This seriously brings the validity and accuracy of Mosher's book into question. While Bernstein disregards these concerns, I will not do that. There are many reasons to believe that Mosher's book is at least biased and possibly even purposefully misleading. The Stanford University, where Mr. Mosher was a candidate for a PhD while interested in investigation, Stanford announced that Mr. Mosher had engaged in illegal and seriously unethical acts and terminated his candidacy. Overall, this article might give a different perspective, but the claims that it makes are not supported by evidence. Next. Source. I like this one the most because it's the most reliable. It's a science article titled The Long-Term Impact of the Communist Revolution on Social Stratification in Contemporary China. It was published by Yu Xie and Chun Zhang in 2019. Yu Xie is a Chinese-American sociologist who studied at Peking University and Princeton University. He has published books on both America and China. Chun Zhang also studied at Peking University. Their paper reports findings from a systematic study of the long-term impact of the communist revolution on social stratification in today's China. It has a precise method and reaches a definitive conclusion that the Chinese communist revolution fundamentally altered the pre-revolutionary social stratification order over the long term. The study showed that the revolution disrupted the cross-generational reproduction of the prevailing social stratification at the time of the revolution in promoting the social status of children of the red, poor peasant, and worker classes and disadvantaging those from privileged classes. So, according to this source, the revolution had a positive effect and brought progress in the long term. The information in this paper is presented in a way that's easy to read and since both of the authors have previous experience and excellent quality data, their conclusion is very well supported. Next, source. The third source is a propaganda poster. Why did I add it? Because it looks cool. Very nice. Now that I think about it, I can't show it to you guys because it's a podcast. I'm going to put a link to it at the bottom. Anyways, 
The poster is from 1952 and is titled Building the Tianlan Railway. It depicts many Chinese people working together to build the train track. In the lower right corner, you can see two people in brown suits who are Soviet engineers. Interestingly, the construction of the Tianlan Railway was finished by 1953, so one year after the poster was made. Interestingly, the construction of the Tianlan Railway was finished by 1953, as well as the construction of two other important railways. This poster is significant because it gives an example of building and economic development in China after the revolution. It also shows the working conditions. People can be seen carrying wooden planks to the top of a mountain while wearing sandals. Of course, this doesn't sound very appealing, but the workers seem to be proud of their efforts and of the results. Overall, the source isn't incredibly reliable because it's, you know, propaganda, but it provides an example that shows how quickly the infrastructure grew after the revolution. Last source. The concluding source I'm using is an interview that I did with a Chinese woman of about 35 to 40 years of age and who wished to remain anonymous. Now, I'm basically an amateur with interviews, so don't expect anything fancy. Although the woman I interviewed was too young to be alive at the time of the revolution, she had a grandmother who remembered it very well. The woman said that her grandma sometimes told her stories about the revolution. It was a horrible time. When asked whether or not the revolution changed things for the better, the woman said a definitive yes. Grandma said that before things were much worse, especially for women. When I was small, she used to tell me how her parents thought she was a burden and wanted a son instead. She was a farmer when she was young, and she was very proud of me when I moved to Beijing. Overall, from this interview, I found out that the most significant change the grandmother experienced was the changed role of women. The communist revolution made a substantial progress in that area. Conclusion time. Overall, three out of four sources I picked agreed that the communist revolution did bring positive change to China. Although the New York Times article disagreed, it was the least supported of the four, and it was combated by the PNAS science paper. The interview with the person whose family member went through the revolution confirmed the rest of the sources. All in all, development experienced by China since the establishment of the People's Republic of China definitely meant progress. Well, that's the end. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check the description for the bibliography. Credit for the music goes to Lish Grooves. I've linked their channel. They make fantastic chill-slash-lo-fi music that is free to use for anyone. Bye!